The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. Our webinar topic today is Know Your Tumor, Acoustic Neuroma. My name is Umbreen Mann, Program Manager here at the ABTA, and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Dr. Linda B. is a skull-based tumor neurosurgeon in the Center for skull Base and Pituitary Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School. Dr. B. specializes in the care of patients with complex brain and skull-based tumors with a focus on meningiomas, acoustic neuromas, and pituitary tumors. In addition to her expertise in open and endoscopic skull-based surgery, her research is unveiling the biology and genomics of these complex brain tumors to better guide patients and offer expanded treatment options. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. B. You may now begin your presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure and a delight to join the ABTA for this educational webinar on acoustic neuromas. I have no disclosures. The learning objectives are to understand the epidemiology presentation and symptoms of acoustic neuromas, overview the standard treatment options, as well as to think about the long-term implications for patients with these tumors. As many of you might already be familiar, acoustic neuromas are also known as vestibular schwannomas and commonly uh, fondly referred to as simply acoustics. And they are tumors that are, come in all sizes and shapes and arise from the balanced nerve or the eighth nerve, which is a complex of nerves that reside together between the facial nerve two vestibular balance nerves and the cochlear or auditory hearing nerve. These four nerves are bundled together in a very tight space in the cerebellopontine angle at the side of the brainstem. And tumors that arise from either one of the vestibular nerves as they grow can expand and press upon the hearing nerve and the facial nerve. In years past, because hearing loss was such a common symptom of acoustic neuromas, these were felt to be tumors arising from the acoustic nerve, hence acoustic neuromas. And as our understanding improved over the years with the recognition that they actually arise from the vestibular nerve, we have uh, gradually shifted the nomenclature to that of vestibular schwannomas. So what causes an acoustic neuroma? Fundamentally, in the vast majority of these tumors, it is caused by an alteration such as a mutation or a loss of a gene called neurofibromatosis um, 2 on the chromosome 22. This was actually one of the first genetic causes of a tumor identified in humans as well as the brain. Alteration of NF2 can cause two patterns of tumors, those that are hereditary and come in syndromes such as neurofibromatosis 2, or those that are um, one-offs, what we call sporadic, and they manifest as schwannomas or meningiomas. The vast majority of vestibular schwannomas are in the sporadic category, meaning 99% of them are usually not related to a hereditary syndrome. When it is related to a hereditary syndrome, such as neurofibromatosis 2, patients often have a constellation of other tumors and signs that are associated with this, as depicted in this picture here. The formal diagnostic criteria for neurofibromatosis 2 are listed here, but classically is identified, or at least the trigger for thinking about neurofibromatosis 2 is identified by either the combination of bilateral acoustic neuromas in a patient or concurrent meningiomas and acoustic neuromas in a patient. In those who have neurofibromatosis 2, half of them do not have a prior family history and half of them will pass on to their child. But for the majority of today's talk, um, we're gonna focus on the majority of these tumors, the 99% that are unilateral or sporadic acoustic neuromas. What you can see from this picture is that for the majority of vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas, um, the age of diagnosis spans the decades of life. But in those who have bilateral tumors, 
in other words, are more likely to be associated with a syndrome, there's a much higher percentage that are likely to be diagnosed at a young age, in their teens or early 20s. Whereas those that are uh, diagnosed at an older age that are the sporadic acoustic neuromas usually happen in the uh, older or middle-aged adult. So focusing on sporadic acoustic neuromas for the majority of this talk, it has been observed by a number of studies that the incidence of acoustic neuromas has been rising over the years. Furthermore, um, as shown on this plot, with the y-axis representing the size of the tumor and the years plotted along the x-axis, the size of the tumor at the time of diagnosis is much less. One diagnosed patients typically have better hearing, as seen on this picture, in which the y-axis uh, is a score of hearing or speech discrimination. And again, each year of time of history goes along the x-axis. There are many reasons for this, but the most common uh, we felt would be that of the fact that we have better technologies now. We have easy access to CT scans and MRIs. So for many reasons, patients might easily um, get a scan of their head, either for a symptom or for an unrelated reason and detect the acoustic neuroma. It puts a unique spin on what to do, which we're gonna get to shortly. So in other words, as we have increased detection of tumors and they're being detected as smaller sizes with better hearing, how do we proceed? Well, first of all, what is the formal diagnosis of acoustic neuromas? How does it come about? Amongst patients who have uh, vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas, a little bit over half of them present with hearing loss. It's the single most common finding that we hear. And that could be either objective hearing loss, meaning that they tend to, um, they notice that they have to use a different ear to pick up the phone and have conversations, or, uh, uh, or hearing loss that can sometimes be subtle and detected on a formal hearing test. This is followed by a constellation of symptoms such as dizziness, ringing in the ears, also known as tinnitus, or a good increasing fraction being incidental, meaning completely asymptomatic. Of note, despite the fact that the facial nerve is intimately related to the hearing nerve and the vestibular nerve in the same bundle that goes into the internal auditory canal, facial weakness is extremely rare at presentation and diagnosis in vestibular schwannomas, affecting about two to two and a half percent of all patients. In contrast, facial numbness is much more frequent as seen on this pie chart here. The pattern of hearing loss that is classically associated with acoustic neuromas is that of an asymmetric hearing loss with hearing loss in the uh, side of the ear that has the tumor. This is shown by an audiogram here in which the right ear has a much worse hearing, meaning much lower slopes on this um, detection of sound. Another key parameter in interpreting an audiogram is the word recognition score, also known as speech recognition. And that is in which patients here uh, are able to identify speech and words at certain levels of sound. This is useful because it helps identify functional or useful hearing for us in our daily lives. Once through whatever symptom, whether it's hearing loss or something else, patients are suspected to have an acoustic neuroma, frequently an image happens. And the standard image is that of an MRI, which can either be with contrast as seen on the left or without contrast as seen on the right. I will point out that there are the vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas can um, arise any point along the nerve, which means that part of it can grow within the internal auditory canal, which is this uh, cone of the ice cream right here, and other parts of it can grow in what we call the cisternal space or outside of the meatus, the lip of the internal auditory canal. And it's that um, part that's within the skull outside of the internal auditory canal that as that grows, we become more and more worried because it can press on the brainstem and cause other symptoms, such as in the example seen here. You see the normal brain and brainstem being pushed by this contrast enhancing tumor. Upon diagnosis of a vestibular schwannoma, what do we do? There are two major pathways. 
that of observation and that of treatment or an intervention. Especially as we're picking up more and more tumors at small sizes with excellent function, this dilemma has never been more keen for us to understand. Observation entails, in essence, getting serial MRIs and audiograms to monitor function, whereas intervention is one of two major pathways, which is surgery and radiation, which I will get to shortly. What to do depends on a number of factors, including tumor size, the function of the patient, including their hearing function, dizziness, what their handicap is, the age and overall health of the patient, the preference of the patient, and in, uh, to do a key part, whether we think this is a sporadic or a familial, meaning a neurofibromatosis to associated tumor. The size of the tumor is one of the most important factors in determining what to do, as well as how patients will do with treatment or observation. In general, we colloquially think of acoustic neuromas as small, medium, or large. And that is defined uh, to a large extent by the portion of the tumor, which is within the uh, intracranial space. In other words, outside of the, inter the internal auditory canal and within the cisternal component, because that's the component that can grow and push on the brainstem, cause unsteadiness, um, increase in pressures in the brain and other such symptoms. So it's that extra meatal or within the skull um, component that we usually think about for definition of small, medium, and large. Our former criteria, which physicians use to define small, medium, and large, one of them is this, in which everything that's within, confined to within the internal auditory canal, or less than one centimeter when outside of the internal auditory canal for that extra medial component is considered small. Medium goes from anywhere from one to two or one to 2.5 centimeters for that extra medial component. And large is defined as anywhere from 2.6 to 4 centimeters, or in this um, classification system, 3 to 4 centimeters. Those that are greater than 4 centimeters in maximum dimension are considered giant. So what happens with tumors when we choose observation or getting serial imaging? Well, first of all, what is the goal of observation? The goal of observation is to avoid the risk and the potential um, limitations of treatment. And why is this even an option when you find a brain tumor? Well, first of all, schwannomas have this unique property amongst all brain tumors in which a good proportion of them do not grow after the point of um, detection. In fact, a small proportion of acoustic neuromas spontaneously regresses, what's shown as the negative growth here. So about a third to a half of schwannomas will grow over time, and that average rate of growth is one to two millimeters per year. Such a slow growth rate allows us to have a very controlled environment to be able to watch and follow these tumors before anything devastating happens so that we can intervene at an appropriate time. So in summary, the frequency of growth is that about on average, depending on the study, about a third, 40 to 50% of tumors might grow over a long period of follow-up. A proportion of those will eventually require treatment. Those tumors um, that grow frequently grow in the first few years after detection um, monitoring. However, there is a small fraction of tumors that show the first evidence of growth after five years after initial detection. So long-term monitoring is a key principle of acoustic neuromas, which I will um, hammer back to frequently during this talk. Well, if we were to observe this tumor, and um, what are the costs of that? One of those costs is that function can decline even if the tumor is small or if it doesn't grow. In these series of studies, what this shows first on the left is a number of patients on their serial visits. And you can see as each visit progresses, visit two, three, four, five, six, that the um, percentage of good hearing, which in this case is classified as A or B, meaning the white or the light gray, diminishes over time. And the percentage of bad hearing, which is the black or the striped bars increases over time. 
This is even true for very small tumors. For example, in this study, a plot of intracanalicular acoustic neuromas, meaning those that are confined to the internal auditory canal and are by definition on the small side. So even for these small tumors, at 10-year follow-up, the hearing will decline over time, which is quite significant. So um, those tumors that do grow will have worse hearing, but those tumors that don't grow will still are still at risk of losing hearing. So observation is most frequently confined to small tumors and possibly some medium tumors. Large tumors are those that we absolutely need to think about treatment, giant tumors certainly so, and medium tumors probably are, can go either way depending on a number of other factors and considerations. So when a tumor does make it to the point of intervention or treatment, what happens? Well, of the two most common treatment modalities, surgery and radiation, you can see in this epidemiologic study that the patterns of treatment differs um, for surgery up top and radiation down below based on the age of the patient and, and frankly, based on uh, the geographic location in the country and other uh, preferences that are beyond the tumor characteristic itself. With uh, far more patients who are young receiving surgery and those patients who are older having a higher likelihood of receiving radiation. So let's focus on surgery first. Surgery is indicated for large or giant tumors, those tumors that are having pressure on the brain, those tumors that are steadily growing with observation, and in the case of the small tumor, the desire for preserving hearing. The goal of surgery is for maximum safe resection with preservation of function. The two most important are that of facial function and hearing function, but also in general quality of life and neurologic function. Maximum safe resection is up to the judgment of the surgeon, with the goal being complete resection, also, told, also called gross total resection. But sometimes the tumor can be very stuck to the facial nerve, and uh, our, the general trend, I think, worldwide is that all of us would rather leave a very thin sliver, a millimeter, on the facial nerve if it's extremely stuck, rather than uh, risk the functional decline of the patient with facial weakness. There are a number of critical factors to surgical outcome, and those include, first, as I mentioned, tumor size, including how far the tumor extends to the end of the internal auditory canal, also known as the fundus. Large tumors in general across all modalities have higher risk for facial weakness as well as worse hearing. Those tumors that are cystic or fluid-filled are also a special category because they tend to have a higher likelihood of growing faster and are associated with higher risk of facial weakness and neurologic dysfunction. The second most important factor in determining surgical outcome is that of the pre-existing function of the patient. The, in every study done to date, pretty much, the better the function before surgery, meaning the better the hearing and the more perfect the facial function, the better folks do after surgery. And the critical third feature to this is that of surgical experience. Acoustic neuroma surgery is predicated upon meticulous skull-based techniques, and that is really within the realm of a certain type and, and um, of surgeons who see these pathologies routinely. The range of surgical approaches are many, but the three most common which are discussed are that of retrosigmoid, middle fossa, translabyrinthine, and in a very small proportion of tumors confined to the internal auditory canal, endoscopic transcanal surgery. Surgery usually entails the use of a microscope to help magnify the nerves and tiny perforator blood vessels such that the surgeon can be able to tease out fiber by fiber, and frequently surgeons will use the endoscope for assistance with this as well. So to recap, here are two examples of acoustic neuromas, which is indicated by this white blob on the left and this white blob on the right. 
what a retrosigmoid approach is, the sigmoid sinus is one of the major draining veins of the brain. So the retrosigmoid approach, in essence, does a, uh, removes a small patch of bone, what we call craniotomy, gently relaxes the brain away from the bone, and then follows the bone straight down to the tumor, hopefully without touching the brain. The translabyrinthine approach goes through the bone right here and through a structure called the labyrinth, which helps contribute to our sense of balance. It involves drilling away a lot of bone to start at this point and then to work towards the uh, brainstem side of the tumor. The translabyrinthine method is more favorable to smaller and medium tumors, while the retrosigmoid approach is amenable to tumors of all sizes and shapes. A third approach is called the middle fossa approach, which is along the base of the temporal lobe, coming from on top of the tumor, drilling away this bone indicated in black and coming on top of the tumor. The retrosigmoid approach and the middle fossa approach are typically perceived as being hearing preservation approaches, meaning they have the intent and the capability to possibly preserve hearing, whereas the translabyrinthine approach is typically reserved for patients with severe hearing loss already. So what are some surgical strategies to improve outcome? These include use microsurgical technique with skull-based um, approaches, preserving the anatomy, the actual integrity of the nerves, preserving the blood supply to the nerves and the fluid, the cerebral spinal fluid bathing the nerve so that even if the nerve was intact, that the function of those nerves will be maintained over time, using appropriate and vigilant neuromonitoring to look for the nerve function and feedback throughout the surgery, and critically, all of this ties together to the surgeon experience. Surgery can be very successful, even for large and giant tumors, as shown here in five patients before and after surgery with their pre-op MRI and their post-op MRI. All patients did excellently. But the outcome of surgery is not just a picture. It's not just removal and alleviation of the tumor, but it's also critically in acoustic neuroma surgery, the preservation of function. Acoustic neuroma surgery allows for no mistakes because each of these functions are so important to us, that of hearing and that of our smile. So in this example of a patient with a giant cystic um, tumor, what you can see is that she actually presented with excellent hearing. So both her left and her right ears, the blue and the red lines, are similar to each other at the top of the hearing curve. And this is now a few years after surgery, her hearing remains excellent and her smile remains beautiful. This is what we aim for in surgery of every acoustic neuroma patient. What about the second most common modality, that of radiation? Radiation comes in many forms and uh, flavors in terms of uh, the types of machine. In general, we think of acoustic neuromas as being um, treated with stereotactic radiation or focused radiation, which may be administered through in one to five doses at different uh, dose levels called grays and by um, machines called gamma knife or linear accelerator, cyber knife. These are different brands and types of machines. And really I would counsel you or anyone who is um, interested in this to discuss with your treating physician on the nuances and uh, differences between the different radiation doses and types of modality. But the overall goal of radiation is to control tumor growth. It doesn't necessarily take away the tumor, especially for large tumors, but it can shrink it over time or at least stabilize it. The last modality, which unfortunately we have very few recourse for in acoustic neuromas to date, is that of medications. We unfortunately don't yet have uh, drugs that melt away acoustics, although we are working very hard to understand the biology of these tumors. But there is one particular circumstance which I want to highlight, and that is in the case of neurofibromatosis 2, which are really such aggressive tumors that grow and take away hearing from the patient, especially at a young age from both sides. In these patients, a number of novel medications have been tried, one of which is a medication called Avastin or Bevacizumab. 
and in those patients, a vaccine has been shown to deter tumor growth for a period of time and possibly extend the duration of functional hearing. However, eventually the aggressiveness of these tumors will overcome any medication that we have to date. Another point which is frequently uh, increasingly asked about by patients is does taking an aspirin help with the growth of their tumor? And the data on this is quite mixed. Um, the principle for this is that we increasingly appreciate acoustic neuromas is not just a ball of tumor cells, but there are actually a robust component of this tumor, which are immune cells or an inflammatory reaction. And so by giving a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication such as aspirin, there is some thought that this may have uh, benefit to controlling the, the halting the um, growth of the tumor. But as you can imagine, this is quite difficult to measure in a tumor like acoustic neuromas because first of all, more than half of them don't grow over a long period of time. And second of all, if they were already large, they probably would have been candidates for treatment already. How do patients do after getting uh, either observation or treatment over time? Well, first with surgery. The goal of surgery, as I mentioned, is maximum safe resection with preservation of function. In, the, in experienced hands, gross total resection has very excellent outcomes over time, but outcomes are predicated by how long patients are observed for. So at five years, which is what many publications focus on, or 10 years, um, or 20 years, those outcomes differ. And I think it's important for the patient to be cognizant when evaluating the literature and reports, and look at what is the actual outcome uh, follow-up, mean follow-up in the study. In this study from the Mayo Clinic, at 20-year follow-up, what's noted in that even among those with gross total resection, there is a significant percentage which may recur, um, as indicated by the downsloping line. In those with subtotal resection, that recurrence happens very early, within the first two to five years as the line drops down and continues onward with observation. But just because a tumor radiographically recurs does not mean that one needs intervention for it. Often by getting rid of the bulk of the tumor, the small residual can be watched over time or potentially treated with radiation down the line. How about tumor control after radiation? In a number of long-term uh, follow-up studies at 10 years or longer, here's a, a selection of them, we have about a 90 to 98% of tumor control extrapolated for acoustic neuromas. And that again is um, predicated in part by tumor size. How about facial function? Probably the single most important thing that we worry about in terms of preserving uh, function during intervention for um, acoustic neuromas. Well, in general, thankfully, in uh, skilled hands, facial function success rates are quite good across the board, between 90 to almost 100%. The um, uh, difference here is, as I mentioned, the pre-existing facial function, the size of the tumor, probably as the single most important factor, and other characteristics, including how far the tumor extends within or without the internal auditory canal, and again, that of uh, the surgeon's experience. Facial weakness after treatment, specifically surgery, is graded classically by House Brackman grade, which this cartoon shows, which um, goes from grade one to grade six, with grade one being that of perfect function and grade six being complete facial immobility with no movement on the affected side. The critical um, point of divergence is between grade three and grade four. The difference there is that in grade three tumors, patients are able to close their eyes fully. In a modification of this house um grade uh, that has been proposed in more recent years, grade 3A is that they're able to easily close their eyes and protect it well. Grade 3B is that they're able to close it but have some difficulty and therefore the eyes become dry and get corneal abrasions or keratitis. Um, in this scale, what you will appreciate is that aside from the cosmetic features of the smile, the true danger is that of losing vision and harming the eye. So therefore, for most of us, 
if we were to observe facial weakness at any point in the care of an acoustic neuroma patient, what the first and foremost thing that we'd like to warn patients about and think about protecting is that of the eye. This starts off with as easy of an intervention as keeping the eyes lubricated with eye drops during the day and ointment at night, as well as considering if one anticipates a more extended recovery for the facial nerve, temporary uh, procedures such as putting a stitch over the lateral portion of the eyelid to help partially close it, or placing a platinum weight into the eyelid, which our plastic surgery colleagues can help titrate such that the eye is able to be helped to close fully. All of these interventions protect the eye um, and allow the patients to be safe as the facial nerve recovers, which it often does in, early, in cases of early postoperative weakness. There are some rare situations in which the patient wakes up with surgery with perfect facial function, but a few weeks later, they start getting new facial weakness. In these cases, we think that delayed facial weakness after perfect function after surgery is from reactivation of uh, an infection, a herpes infection. And so the treatment for that is antiviral medication and steroids. And patients usually do very, very well with medical management. In those cases, which after three to six months, after six to nine months, uh, or even up to a year in which the facial nerve does not recover, which is the majority of cases, um, as long as the nerve is preserved anatomically intact, there are also options for facial augmentation and reanimation, which we collaborate with our ENT and um, facial plastics partners to consider. How about for hearing outcomes? Hearing, as surgeons get better and better at preserving facial strength, which is anywhere from uh, the 90% to the high 90%, we have shifted our attention to preserving hearing, which is such an important um, function to our quality of life. I mentioned that hearing is measured by audiograms and divided into another scale um, in which depicted here, A, B, C, and D. Classically, Class A and B hearing are considered serviceable, whereas class C and D hearing are considered unservable, serviceable, or less functional. This frequently guides the recommendation for a hearing preservation surgery versus a translabyrinthine approach. However, depending on exactly what the hearing is and what the patient is able to do with the hearing, I will caution that it's not quite so straightforward. For example, in this patient whose hearing declines and may be considered unserviceable, but that unserviceable range, if we think about it in practical terms of hearing loss, meaning the uh, moderate to severe or profound hearing loss range, is the ability to hear, for example, the train coming down the tracks or the plane lifting off or the honking of a car. So even severe hearing loss may still preserve some hearing that could be useful either in the future or with hearing augmentation. Across the in hearing preservation surgeries, in other words, those that have the intent to possibly preserve hearing, um, the success rate of uh, hearing preservation is approximately 50% is what's quoted. And that ranges, again, based on how small the tumor is. The smaller the tumor, the higher the success rate. The larger the tumor, the worse. The worse the preoperative hearing, the less the likelihood of preserving hearing. So the same themes that we see in um, the, the natural history of these tumors all around. But in essence, thinking about hearing preservation, especially in a small tumor with excellent hearing, uh, has very, very good chances of preserving it and for the sake of saving that hearing over time. By preserving hearing with surgery, that hearing preservation can be durable. For example, in this study, in which a seven-year follow-up, those with preserved hearing had 86% likelihood of maintaining that hearing and a small percentage even improved hearing by at least one point after surgery. As I also mentioned, the intent to save the cochlear nerve, meaning the nerve that transmits the hearing sounds, is quite important because as we develop new technologies, there are more and more hearing augmentation strategies that can be considered either at the time of surgery or down the line. 
but those require there to be an intact hearing apparatus and uh, for us to be able to implement um, the ability to augment hearing down the line. In this particular intriguing study by an Italian group who are really leaders in hearing augmentation and cochlear implants, uh, Dr. Sana and colleagues put in a cochlear implant with resection of vestibular trinomas at the time of surgery. And those patients had normal contralateral hearing. In this scale, in which the y-axis is a, a, a quality of life or a um, satisfaction sort of grading, what you notice is that patients, in essence, feel some improved uh, hearing and as well as quality of life with um, cochlear implant implantation. How about hearing with radiation? What we notice again is that the outcome differs by how long we track patients for. So in this excellent study by the Mayo Group, over a long period of follow-up, at 10 years, less than a quarter of patients had serviceable hearing. Smaller tumors, again, do better, but even smaller tumors had only about a third of serviceable hearing, meaning those less than one centimeters at 10 years. Those with excellent hearing, almost perfect hearing, what we call class A, also do better. But again, even the class A hearing patients do at 10 years have a very high likelihood of losing hearing. So taken together, what do we think about hearing? A hearing will decline. Um, with no intervention, there is about 50% chance of preserving hearing with surgery, with a much higher chance up to 70 or 80% if the tumor is small and if there's some favorable characteristics, including good hearing before surgery. Long-term follow-up, at least to 10 years and beyond, have a 20% chance of hearing preservation. And perhaps that will diminish even further if we get to 15 or 20 years in the future as studies accrue. There are favorable patient characteristics for hearing preservation, and these should be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis with your surgeon. There are concrete surgical techniques for maximizing the chance of hearing preservation at the time of surgery. And if hearing is lost or the nerve is intact, to consider hearing augmentation options, such as a cochlear implant. How about quality of life? as patients um, undergo either observation, surgery, or radiation. So what we know that overall quality of life is fairly comparable in a number of studies. So these on the plot on the left, each color dot is the patient with the green being a control population, the red, orange, blue, and purple being those with vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas. And you can see that the average is about the same. However, there are specific domains in which, um, such as facial function, in which the quality of life for after surgery is a little bit less than that for after radiation or observation, likewise, perhaps for um, hearing. However, one must remember that there is a selection bias in which patients who undergo surgery are probably more likely to have the larger tumors, as opposed to those who have small tumors with good function are more likely to have observation. So with all that said, given the importance and the dynamic change of both function and growth of acoustic normals over time, the critical most single most important thing that I might impart is a need for long-term follow-up with a dedicated specialized team who can monitor for each of these modalities as one continues in your care. So thank you very much for your attention today and also thank you to all the acoustic neuroma patients whose experiences have taught us so much. If there are any questions that I did not address during this talk, um, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. B. We will now take questions. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please type and submit it using the question box in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll answer questions as time allows. So, Dr. B, one of the first questions that we have here is asking, can a hearing aid or something like a cochlear implant help uh, hearing in the ear that has been affected by partial hearing loss due to an acoustic neuroma? Yes. 
so about, I think an experienced team of audiologists as well as um, otologists can assist with this, but many of our patients do benefit from hearing aids, especially if there is only partial loss of hearing um, with or without treatment. Thank you. Another question we have is asking about finding the right treatment, um, the right provider and the right treatment team. Can you share how patients and family members can best judge experience to find the right provider? Should they be looking at factors such as number of procedures done a year? Are there any other factors that they should be considering? Absolutely. Um, I think this is, you know, such an important question and very difficult to uh, distill in a visit. I do think that patients are, in general, very, very intelligent. And so the sense of trust that they have with a surgeon upon initial encounter, the asking explicit questions, including, you know, what are your outcomes? May I speak to a previous patient who has had a similar size or complexity of tumor as I've had? Um, you know, what do you recommend in terms of observation for treatment? That maybe treatment is not the only answer. Uh, asking for concrete numbers can be helpful, but numbers aren't the full picture. You know, some folks with um, smaller numbers may have excellent outcomes because of the techniques that they use, and those with more numbers aren't 100% of the time correlated with better outcomes. So I do think it's a, um, a, a complex array, but being honest and being explicit and asking about, you know, those outcomes, that experience, um, previous patients, um, and also even looking at, you know, the website, for example, for a major center, academic center, or otherwise, to see if this is the sort of tumor that they seem to have expertise in, I think are all helpful strategies. That's wonderful advice. Thank you so much. We also have a few questions here asking about balance issues due to the tumor, due to um, the treatments that patient undergo. Are balance issues temporary? Do you see them subsiding over time or after treatment has been done? That's a great question and one that is increasingly studied these days. So balance, I think, has uh, two parts. One of that of the actual balance and also intimately related is that of dizziness. Um, relating to balance. In patients, we frequently counsel, in patients who have no balance difficulties before treatment, specifically surgery, they may have much more difficulty in the early postoperative period because we cut the vestibular nerve in order to take the tumor that's stemming from it. So we actually promote and encourage patients to work through that imbalance rather than to suppress it with medications because the brain has this amazing ability for the other side of the brainstem to pick up some of those cues and to compensate over time, both with increasing uh, sensation of that imbalance, as well as with sometimes vestibular rehab and physical therapy. Um, in patients who present with dizziness or with imbalance up front, frequently that can get better after surgery. But there are a percentage of patients who continue to struggle with some quality of life symptoms, even over time. Up to a quarter or a third of patients have some difficulty, uh, which may not impact their daily life, meaning they may be mild, but can be reported on uh, various quality of life surveys. Thank you so much for that. Um, another question we have is asking, are acoustic neuromas considered cancerous? Are they malignant or are they benign tumors? That's good. They are not considered cancerous. Um, so acoustic neuromas in general, the 99% of them that are uh, sporadic, are they're all considered benign. The 1% of them that is associated with neurofibromatosis too, although this isn't specifically considered like a cancer or malignant, but they can be very aggressive. They are insidious in their growth. They occur on both sides very frequently. So the balance and the um, equation there is how to preserve and maximize the longest possible function in that patient over the course of their anticipated life, rather than jumping in too early or um, too aggressively to possibly intervene on the first sign of change. So uh, in essence, vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas are benign tumors. They are fairly indolent, as we saw on the natural history curves um, 
earlier on in this, that even those which grow, which are only a less than half of all tumors, grow at on the order of one to two millimeters per year, which is fairly uh, slow in the scheme of tumor biology. And what is the recurrence rate for acoustic neuromas? Um, if, if someone's had one in the past, they've had surgery, is it common for it to return in the future? That's a great question. I'm going to go back, if I could, to one of the slides that shows this. So um, this is a slide for recurrence after surgery, which is uh, predicated upon how much of the tumor is taken out, um, meaning gross total resection is all microscopic tumor that the surgeon can see was taken out, or subtotal resection means the surgeon may have to leave a little. There are also gradations between these, something called near total resection, which is maybe between 2% to 5% of the tumor is left behind, usually that of a thin rind that's plastered on the facial nerve or the brainstem. Um, and subtotal resection usually implies slightly more tumor left behind. So the likelihood of recurrence depends on how much tumor was taken out. Um, also, it depends on how long the patient is followed for. So at 20 years, as shown in this picture, there is a significant chance of the tumor coming back. But frequently, even when we see it coming back, it doesn't necessarily come back to anywhere near the size of what the original tumor was. As you can imagine, if there's just a single little cell that's growing slowly over time, it might become a visible uh, a spot on subsequent MRIs at 10 years or 20 years, but still without symptoms and without mass effect on the brainstem, and therefore it can be continue to be observed over time. Thank you so much. Uh, another question we have here is asking, is there a link between having had uh, another brain tumor in the past and then developing an acoustic neuroma in the future? For example, is having a past meningioma linked to developing acoustic neuroma in the future? Um, in, for sporadic tumors, no. All the meningiomas and vestibular schwannomas or acoustic neuromas are both have stem from the same the most common genetic alteration in both tumors is that of an alteration in this gene, NF2. Uh, but the concern is that if a patient um, does develop both, there may be some underlying uh, mosaic and, um, NF2 alteration,s which a, a, a surgeon or oncologist or a physician should evaluate more deeply. Meningiomas are the most common brain tumors in adults, so probably one out of every hundred patients over the age of 45 might have a small meningioma of some sort. So having um, a common condition next to another, you know, not uncommon tumor, the two can happen by chance. But when the two happen around the same time or are detected, then it should raise concern at least for a workup to make sure there's no underlying genetic syndrome. Thank you so much. And another question we have is asking about treatment for recurrences. If you had uh, an acoustic neuroma in the past and now you've had a reoccurrence, are the treatment options different? Are they able to have radiation again or surgery again? What does that look like for the patient? That's one. Um, so I'll start with surgery, uh, salvage surgery after prior treatment. In this case, it sounds like the prior treatment might be prior um, radiation, you know, for a recurrent vestibular schwannoma. First of all, I'll back up and say just because the tumor is growing again does not necessarily mean that it needs treatment. Observation is a vital part of this three-armed management pathway for uh, acoustic neuromas. And thinking about temporizing as many years as possible, perhaps buying another five years of close observation, if that recurrence is very, very slow, could be worthwhile to the quality of life. So I will put that out there as a very important um, branch of the tree to think about. Uh, and secondly, surgery um, after prior radiation is in general felt to be more challenging with higher risks and more complications. Um, it doesn't mean that patients can't do well, 
the things are more sticky, the nerves are much more difficult to peel off at that point in time. So there have been studies on what does the outcome of salvage surgery looks like, and patients can do very well from a function preservation perspective, almost comparable perhaps to um, that of the original surgery, but it's probably because the surgeon is more careful in those circumstances and perhaps less aggressive at pursuing the margin against the nerve. So um, a lot of it is surgical judgment or the judgment of the treating physician in um, dictating the outcome. A second round of radiation um, has also been considered, but again, carries the additional, confers the additional risks you know, of another round, which we mentioned already was probably an you know, almost definite likelihood of hearing loss over a long-term period. Uh, thankfully, a lower risk of facial weakness. Um, it exists, but much, much lower. Um, so a second round of treatment uh, is necessary in some cases and does, in general, have a little bit of higher risk um, and should be discussed on an individual basis. Thank you. And uh, are you, just to clarify then, for tumors that are, are smaller and have minimal symptoms, the best method would be observation? So observation is certainly a commonly practiced um, pathway for small tumors with minimal symptoms. And if I were to meet a patient today, you know, the first thing I would do uh, with that criteria is to at least get another scan, see how their hearing is. The risk of observation, as I mentioned, is that of hearing decline. So it depends on the specific imaging features of the, um, of the tumor. So for a tumor with excellent hearing, for example, in this case, this tumor is right there, it's quite small. If it were to grow a little bit, the cell has all of this fluid at the end of the internal auditory canal and the hearing is excellent, this might be a very favorable tumor for removing. Uh, with observation, hearing will decline. So it depends on how valuable that hearing is to you as an individual or to the patient. For many folks, hearing is a precious commodity. So one takes the upfront up to 50% risk of losing hearing altogether, which will go over time as with or without treatment um, for possibly preserving the 50% chance of preserving hearing uh, by intervening, specifically having surgery early in the case of a small acoustic neuroma versus not taking that chance, but letting the natural history and the likely hearing decline, um, you know, declare itself over time. Thank you. And do you know if there's any preventive measures aside from treatment that can be done during that observation period? Um, you know, that a patient can do to try to protect their hearing or, or try to reduce some of the symptoms that they might experience like balance loss, hearing loss? I see. Um, to preserve actual function, uh, I'm not aware of any, um, I, there are no well-supported interventions to preserve function during the period of observation. Um, Non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory medications like aspirin has been posited to maybe have some effect on hearing loss, but other studies have not supported this, so it's still quite controversial. Um, based on biology, there is some support for that, and if one thinks that a growing tumor has a higher risk of losing function, specifically in hearing, then perhaps that might be a, a low-risk intervention. But other than that, there aren't, um, there aren't unfortunately at present, any great uh, options that we have on hand. Thank you. And another question we have is asking, do you know if proton therapy is an effective treatment for acoustic neuromas? That's a great question. So um, the difference between proton therapy and photon therapy, which is everything else that I've shown in uh, the radiation options here, um, is the targeting. Proton has the benefit of having a sharp cut off where the, the beam arises, whereas the um, photon-based therapy, the gamma knife, the line act, the cyber knife, have the benefit of focusing to a single point. So in general, for um, acoustic neuromas, uh, the modalities that are, that are listed here probably have a slight advantage over proton, although it certainly has been used. But the ability to focus 
the radiation on the tumor itself is probably favorable for acoustic neuromas. Thank you so much. Uh, another question we have here is asking about lymph nodes. Do acoustic neuromas impact lymph nodes as all, at all? If a patient has an acoustic neuroma, will they develop a swollen lymph node, for example, in the, in the neck or other areas? Uh, acoustic neuromas are not known to metastasize or travel outside of the area that is affected. So um, staging or, or looking for lymph nodes or spread to other areas is not typically uh, associated with acoustics. Thank you so much. I think we'll take one more question. Uh, this question is asking about um, tumors that are in observation. Do do you ever have a case where you're observing a tumor and it starts to diminish on its own? Um, or have you noticed that despite the case of the original size, eventually treatment is necessary? So uh, statistically speaking, you know, maybe about 20% of tumors might shrink a little bit. Doesn't mean that they shrink uh, disappear altogether, but but there is definitely a documented percentage of um, tumors that do spontaneously regress. Uh, on the other hand, for those tumors that are observed, there is also a good proportion of them that will eventually require an intervention, about a third to a half, depending on um, you know the study and the the specific conditions. The reason why the number is not 100% is because if the patient already came in with a large tumor and with symptoms, treatment probably already would have been uh, offered. Well, thank you so much, Dr. B. That is all the time that we have for questions today. Um, I want to thank you again for joining us and for sharing your insight. And thank you to all of our attendees for uh, joining us as well. Aside from our educational webinar series, the ABTA has a variety of programs that help support patients and caregivers throughout their experience. For more information about ABTA's programs, events, and services, visit ABTA's website at abta.org, email us at info at abta.org, or call the ABTA Care Line at 1-800-886-2282.